Bum, 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 bum. You're listening to Tov, a podcast about the good place and Jewish ideas. Hi, I'm John Spirosavet, and I'm so excited to welcome as my co-host today, Rebecca Rosenthal, also a rabbi. Rebecca, where do you rabbi? I am the director of youth and family education at Central Synagogue in New York City. So I do everything for uh, families with children, early childhood, religious school, teens, Shabbat, all kinds of different things with the families. Rebecca is one of the people I admire uh, the most in the field of everything she just listed, and also one of the people I've been talking about this podcast idea with for months, so it's so exciting to, to be here and do this with you. And I wanted to ask you, which of our main characters do you identify with the most? You know, I thought about this for a long time after you told me uh, that you were going to ask me this question, because I feel a little bit like I don't know if you ever saw around Passover, they did, you know, the four children of the good place, the wise one, the wicked one, right? And and the ultimate conclusion, I think, of the four children is we're all a little bit of all of them. And so that's a little bit how I feel about the good place, which is I'm all a little bit of all of them. But the more I thought about it, I also think of myself as being like Michael, where I make a lot of plans and sometimes they go very badly and I try not to freak out about it. And Michael does, you know, better and worse job of not freaking out about it uh, over the course of the series. But um, a lot of what I do in my in my job, especially, is sort of like the big picture. And then I work together with a lot of different people on my team to try to put together all the details, you know, unlimited frozen yogurt chops and that kind of thing. <laughs> Excellent. And if you could make yourself more of one of the other ones that you obviously say you have a little bit in you already, which one would you would you want to be more of? You know, I I definitely admire Eleanor's drive to become a better person and the way in which she just puts it all out there. Like, this is my plan and this is what I'm going to do. And I think of Eleanor as being someone whose brain is always five steps ahead that she, you know, I won't get, I won't give away the end of season one. Right. But she's the one who figures out the big plot twist. And so that idea of sort of always thinking about What's the next thing that's coming? How does that fit in with my life? Um, how can I, how can I work on getting there and maybe be a better person in the process? I I admire that about Eleanor. That is such an interesting description of Eleanor, and that's great. I hadn't thought of her like from the start that way. And of course, I too have seen everything coming <laughs> ahead. So we'll see that. Do you have any kind of um, good place origin story? How you first learn about the show or really got into it? You know, I think. The way I really got into it is that I saw a commercial for it before it came out on NBC. And I thought, well, I like Kristen Bell and Ted Danson, and it looks kind of interesting. And um, it's about the afterlife, and I'm a rabbi, and it's a thing I think about. And so I should watch this show. And so I actually, I believe I started watching it from the very beginning um, and continued to watch it. And then I got my husband into it, and we went back a little, and then we watched all the way through. And actually, Towards the beginning of the pandemic, I was also watching it with my now 13-year-old son. Um, and we, we started at the beginning and we watched all the way till the end. And that has been a great experience for us just to have sort of that nightly ritual of watching different shows and especially this show. There's so much to think about and talk about and I'm really processed with the show, which is, I guess, why we're making a whole podcast about it. <laughs> so we're here talking about Chapter 4, Jason Mendoza. Do you want to give us a summary of the episode? Sure. So this is a summary you sent me. I don't, I'm not sure. Where's it from? I think I wrote this actually. I might've, I might've started with the whatever fan wiki thing, but I I edited it. Well, I will do it in my best John Spiros of that voice. (laughs) In the town square, Jianyu reveals to Eleanor that he is not a Taiwanese monk, but an amateur DJ and drug dealer named Jason Mendoza from Jacksonville, Florida. His meditation room is, in fact, his bud hole, a man cave with music posters and video games. Eleanor urges Jason to continue to hide his identity. But during her class with Chidi, Jason blasts his electronic dance music from Tahani's house. They hurry over and Eleanor manages to get Jason and Chidi out before Tahani learns the truth. Her plan is for Jason to continue to pretend to be Jianyu in public while he joins Chidi's ethics class with her. But Jason wants to be himself as he says also in flashbacks to his capers in Florida, which involved being pelted as a DJ 
and setting a boat on fire. Michael asked Tahani to organize the grand opening of Patricia's new restaurant, The Good Plates, where all the diners are served their favorite meal from their lives on earth. Michael asks everyone to tell the story of their meal. And before Jason tells his real story, Eleanor creates a distraction, which results in the opening of a sinkhole. Tahani resigns as Michael's assistant, but then agrees to stay on and help keep morale high in the neighborhood while the sinkhole goes away and the restaurant is rebuilt. Eleanor finally persuades Jason to take Chidi's ethics class with her, explaining that they both suck and their only hope is this selfless, amazing nerd. But when Tahani looks inside Patricia's restaurant, she sees that the sinkhole is only getting larger. All right. So do you have any particular favorite aspects of this episode? Oh, my God. I was watching it and I was just writing. I think I wrote down the whole episode. <laughs> but I think for me, the things that were really stood out is this is the beginning of the running Jacksonville, Florida joke that happens all through the series. So deep apologies to those who live in Jacksonville, Florida, that they've become the butt of this joke. I also love that Tahani has her evening gloves and her mid-afternoon gloves <laughs> and her morning gloves, and she just comes in to exchange them. But I think, I have to say, I think my favorite line is uh, when Michael says that you can be 104% perfect, which is how you got <laughs> Beyonce, um, which I think many people would agree with him on, on that one. There were just like so many funny parts to this episode, as there are to all of them. But I think one of the great things about this show is the way in which even the funny parts have like a little bit of, you know, you, they're, they're tinged with a little bit of truth underneath them, right? That we all maybe strive for 104% per perfection, but the only person who can get there is Beyonce. <laughs> I love the way in which um, uh, Jason expresses himself which, with such earnestness, especially this idea about being himself, which I think we're probably going to talk about while <laughs> describing the most crazy uh, things that he does. And I also loved at the beginning where he was describing how uh, he doesn't like being described as Taiwanese. He says, I'm Filipino. That's racist. Heaven is so racist. <laughs> yes, that was that was also a great moment. And also, I think, again, another joke that has a level of truth underneath it, which is that especially in the world we live in now, understanding how people want to identify and identifying them in that way is so important. Using people's correct pronouns, uh, if people want to be identified by their particular background, identifying them in that way, really being curious about how people want to be identified. And I think that's a theme of this whole episode, which is who are you presenting to the world versus who do you think you are really inside and how do you want to be known to the people around you? Yeah, and I think frustrating people's expectations is is a is a big thing. Um, I love how Michael expresses his enjoyment with things like uh, clever verbal humor, like "Oh, the good plates." Oh, I'm just getting that, or uh, or his whole thing about suspenders. It's very. Uh, yes. I know these things are probably just there to keep us laughing while we're doing getting ready to do like more profound stuff <laughs> in the episode. Well, I love when Michael says suspenders are so dumb. They're so much dumber than belts. <laughs> That really cracked me up. I don't know why, but it was just one of those moments, Michael. And he takes such joy in things that we don't really think about, which I think is a really wonderful quality of of Michael. Um, and and we we learn, you know, that he's not a human, and so he's learning human things. But sometimes, you know, if it in some ways he's like a child looking at Michael, and you're like, oh, you know, that's why children take joy in these things that the rest of us basically take for granted. Hmm. But it's so, true. Maybe suspenders are so much dumber than belts. I don't know. I don't wear suspenders. <laughs> I've worn suspenders on a on a handful of occasions, but mostly decorative. I dressed up uh, for Purim once as Mr. Noodle from you know Elmo's World, who has mm -hmm. suspenders. Who's my favorite Elmo Elmo World characters? I bet you were a big hit with the children. It was fun, and um, yes, to just do goofy things was was a blast. So, do you have a a text or teaching you? related for this episode? Yeah, so this is a text that I learned from my great teacher, Rabbi Sharon Brous, who's the rabbi of Ikar. It comes from the Talmud, and the rabbis are discussing a an instruction from God about the building of the Mishkan, the tabernacle in the desert. And the instruction says that the tabernacle should be covered in gold on the outside, which you understand because it should look beautiful and shiny and very nice. 
But then they say you should also cover it with gold on the inside, which is a part of the tabernacle that no one sees. No one goes in, no one sees the gold. And so the rabbis ask, why should we cover both the inside and the outside with gold? And their answer is uh, the Hebrew words toho kvaro, which means that your insides should always match your outsides. That this instruction about the tabernacle is really an instruction to us about what it means to live authentically in the world. And in fact, they go one step further and they say that if your inside doesn't match your outside, then you cannot even be a Torah scholar. You cannot learn and you cannot be a Torah scholar. And that was just, I think, they have not yet watched The Good Place, the rabbis of the Talmud, but if they had, right, that's so much of what's happening with Eleanor and Jason's journey in this episode and also going forward in the ep- in, in future episodes, which is they are trying to learn, but they are being stymied by the fact that the outside they present to the neighborhood is not able to match the inside and the people that they know who that they are. And so I just thought that this particular text, which Rabbi Brous really teaches is about authenticity and, and integrity and the way that we should behave was so fitting for this episode. What do you, what do you think? I, I love that. It's really interesting. I was thinking as I was watching this one about Jason is that kind of the difference between him and Eleanor is that Eleanor kind of gets a little bit or is starting to get that she maybe inside is not so awesome in every way. And so she's trying to change that. And Jason keeps talking about how much, how like his, he wants to be me. I want, he wants to be himself and, and it's, and he doesn't want to change that. So I was partly thinking about that, like what, you know, there's such a, and, and he, you know, we look at him and you know, he looks so, you know, both goofy and he's not getting anywhere in the, the DJ life. And, but he, you know, he's so, he has this such genuine look in his eyes and genuine earnestness that, uh, that it takes him a long time to, like, I, that, I've been trying to figure out how, like, where that fits into the teaching that you're talking about. You know, I, I wrote down two lines that I were, that really struck me as so poignant. The first is when Jason is, he sort of fails at being Acid Cat, the DJ, and he is talking to his friend and he says to his friend, I should never have pretended to be someone else. It could cost me all of my dreams in life. And that being yourself, there's a value to being yourself because being yourself is what allows you to pursue your dreams. Now, of course, him being himself, he wasn't getting anywhere in his dreams, right? So there's a there's a little bit of a contradiction there, but I, I thought that that was such an important thing to think about. And then together with that, towards the end of the episode, Jason says to Eleanor, I just want to be myself. And she says, that's a very bad idea. You need to be a better version of yourself. And given that we are in the Jewish month of Elul, where we are taking stock of who we've been in the past year and thinking about all the ways we could do better, that is our challenge, right? It's it's actually potentially in Judaism too, a very bad idea just to be yourself, just to be like Jason and going around and saying, I'm great with the way I am. What we want to be is to be like Eleanor and say, I want to be myself but I want to be a a better version of myself. I don't want to just go around telling everyone there there has to be some middle ground between a silent Buddhist monk and a failed DJ from Jacksonville, right? You, you, you want to move along the spectrum, not so much that you lose yourself, but you also want to make sure that you are sort of continuously trying to get better. And that idea, I think of trying to figure out what's the better version of yourself as opposed to, you know, somebody else's, as you said, somebody else's view of you is um, is really hard. I, I, I love that exact line that you were talking about where he's talking to his friend, Pillboy, who's coming back a lot in the show. Um, someday the world will know um, that Jason Mendoza is a beautiful, unique soul. <laughs> and, and he's like, hand me the thing that blows stuff up. <laughs> like right afterwards with that little pregnant pause and um, like how to figure out what that next step is. And yeah, Eleanor's, Eleanor's way of describing that uh, and and nailing that distinction. Because I think I often find myself thinking, especially when you're, I don't know, I'll speak about myself as a rabbi, you have these images of what a, for instance, what a great rabbi is based on other 
other people or other rabbis or even being like a good Jew or, you know, a religious person in the right way. And it's really hard to put that back on yourself and say, well, what's the me? What's the me? Yeah. And I think that's one of the challenges of the way that the good place is set up. And, you know, spoiler alert, we learn potentially that maybe all is not well, but that the what the good place is asking of them actually is to put forward a version of themselves that is the best things they've ever done, right? And so you get the guy who's talking about, I think his name is Glenn, who's talking about his soup and his soup that, you know, wasn't just soup, but it saved 10,000 people. And, you know, everything you do is just sort of blown up so out of proportion because that seems to be what being in the good place is about, only your good self. And I think what Judaism asks of us actually is not only to present your good self to the world, but to present your authentic self to the world and to work on being both a a better person and a better version of yourself, but never, never saying, well, I'm perfect. Everything is perfect. Look at all the perfect things I do. Judaism really acknowledges that we have a yetzer hatov and a yetzer hara, right? A good inclination and an evil inclination. And they're both necessary parts of who we are. And so being in the good place in some ways is limiting to our characters because they can only show to the world how amazing they are. And that's part of what gets Eleanor and Jason in trouble is that they have to be so, they have to be even more fake than the other people who are around them. I think what's great about the show is that originally Eleanor is presented as someone who, you know, she's pretty vile. She has no conscience about, you know, defrauding these old people. And Jason is, is just kind of a goofball who has, who has a vision, but it's, uh, it's a little crazy and a little destructive and a little self-destructive. And how do you pick out of those things? Like out of the ingredients of Jason Mendoza, how do you get a, a person who's not just going to be a unique soul to himself, but is actually going to, you know, be worth um, knowing to the world because of the good things he's done. And maybe what the show is saying is like, there's nobody so far away that they can't find someone, but they've got to start with, as you're saying, where they are. Yes. And I think, Judaism would say, right, you also, you have to start with yourself. That's kind of what this whole time of year that we're in is about, that you have to figure out what it is you did and who you may have hurt and what pain you may have caused to yourself, but also to the people around you. And that until you can be self-reflective, you can't move forward. And and Eleanor is just a little further along, I think, on the self-reflection train than, than Jason is and as we get into the show we see more and more that the characters start to become self-reflective that they start to really be able to think about not only what they did in their lives on earth but what they're doing in the good place and why why different things are happening to them and and what agency they may they may have i think one of the things that we see almost immediately in the good place is the ways in which your actions have real consequences. It's not just your actions on earth that have consequences, and we know that they do, but your actions in the good place also have some, also have some consequences. You know, why why does Glenn end up in the sinkhole? I don't know. Wrong place, wrong time. But Eleanor knows when she plunges her hand into that cake that Patricia spent so much time making, that her actions are going to have a consequence, a destructive one, right? And Chidi's trying to stop her from from doing that because he also knows that the that being in the good place doesn't necessarily mean oh everyone can do whatever they want because everything's fine i mean that's i guess the tagline of the show right everything is fine yeah and we we learn pretty quickly that in fact everything is not fine that your actions really do have have consequences so one of the things i've been thinking about when you mentioned this inside outside thing is i think about what's my own outside and there are a couple aspects, I guess, of me that that I think about a lot that I think shape me. Uh, one is I I am short as people as people who are my age and my gender go, and I think about how much of my persona or how I carry myself is shaped by the amount of physical space I take up in the in the world, especially when some of the people who I admire are kind of larger, they're larger metaphorically because they're larger physically than I am. And so I have to, I have to do different things in order to express myself or, or have a a good influence. And I've often wondered, like, if I, if I woke up and I was, you know, six foot five, 
would I be would I be the same guy? Would I do the same things? And then I think just in terms of uh, kind of personality characteristics that where some of my uh, you know, ways of engaging with people and you know, sometimes wanting to be, you know, conciliatory or leading that way as opposed to starting with this is what I think and, uh, you know, who makes the... F- I think I think almost if, if, I were, if my life were a chess game, I'd rather be black and maybe make the second move after you make the first move. And I, I don't know if that's related to the other thing, but it just seems to be... Uh, ingrained in me and I think okay those are ingredients should I try to I can't fix the the height thing but can I not that that's something that needs to be fixed by the way to anybody but the other thing is something for theoretically I could learn different behaviors but but I have to remind myself not not to do that I got to work with the I got to work with the package I have yeah I think that's the other side of this coin which is self-acceptance you want to try to be the best version of yourself but then there's also the accepting of yourself and for some people that's Jason is very, very accepting of himself, right? He thinks he's great. And Eleanor is like, no, we suck. We have to go to these classes with Chidi. And she starts out as a person who is very accepting of herself. And she's like, hell yeah, I'm in the good place. I am great. And then she sort of moves away from that version of of self-acceptance. And and it's a little bit of accepting the things you cannot change and and changing the things that that you think you need to. And you know, as you were talking, it occurred to me that Jason is the only one in the show who really changes his clothes based on the persona that he's putting out there, that he has his monk outfits. And then when he's in his bud hole, he's wearing you know jeans and a t-shirt or his DJ outfit or whatever it is. Eleanor and, and Tahani and, and Chidi and Michael and Janet, they all wear relatively the same style I think most of the series, but Jason has this sort of inside outside, right? He's when he's wearing his Buddhist monk clothes, he feels like there's a particular behavior that comes with that outside, which is being silent. And when he's wearing his Jason Mendoza clothes, he can then be, you know, his DJ video game playing guy who blows stuff up. And, you know, I think that we have that in our own lives, right? We, get dressed up for particular occasions, or we might wear white on Yom Kippur because we think that that comes with a particular set of behaviors or expectations. But how does sort of what we're putting out on the outside influence the way we decide to behave on the inside? It's really, it's it's great, obviously profound what you're saying, and also just making me think about all these pieces of the writing of this particular episode. We were talking about Michael's suspenders, but and also Tahani's different gloves for which is which is such a less significant version of what you're describing about about Jason. And I was even then thinking about the uh, the acid cat um, helmet thing, which is that you could pretend you could pretend to be me by by just looking at me, looking like me dressing up and then, and how much even Jason back on earth in his, you know, just says, okay, I'm going to take the hat off and show myself. And he's willing to risk being, you know, pelted by hecklers while he's doing his thing. And I wonder how many times we sort of put on someone else's costume in the hopes that we will be treated like that person. It might not be as dramatic as putting on an acid cat helmet, but the Acid Cat Guy basically says to Jason, well, you have no talent, but you have the virtue of being my height and weight. So just put on this helmet and everyone will think that you have talent. If When you're a rabbi and you're standing up there in your white robe on Yom Kippur um, and giving a Devar Torah or a sermon or leading in prayer, people vest that with a certain amount of authority, whether or not you, I know, have earned it because you are a great rabbi, but whether or not you have earned it, people vest that with a particular amount of authority. And it, and I think sometimes we divorce that from the person who's standing up there, right? Like the actual human clergy person who ha- is both great and fallible. And we think like that person is up there on Yom Kippur you know, trying to get God to forgive us for all of our sins, which is not exactly how it works. But I I do, and we do the same thing with some of our, with some of our leaders that we, when people put on the clothing, physical or metaphorical of a particular role, we think that that person, you know, is now, is now in that role, whether they deserve to be there or not. Can I ask you, since you are a rabbi who is a woman and for so long, those two things didn't go together. Does this play for you? Yeah, I I think it's definitely 
something that I think about when, when I came to Central and I realized that the clergy wears robes on the high holidays, part of me was like, woohoo, now I don't have to think about what I'm wearing, right? And, and the congregation doesn't get to make comments about my, my dress or my jacket or anything else because we're all wearing the same thing. I guess they could still make comments about the shoes, but we're basically all, all wearing the same thing. But then uh, we also had this moment where a bunch of us were downstairs in the service for our youngest students at our early childhood service and all the rabbis are wearing their robes. And I'm thinking, this is wrong, right? This creates a separation between us and the families and the kids. And, and I don't want the kids to look at me and say like, there is the rabbi wearing her robe, which is not a woman thing. It's just a, I guess that doesn't completely answer your question, but I, I definitely think that women leaders and clergy people, and I certainly think a lot more about what we wear when we go out in public. Um, you know, it is not, many male rabbis will wear a kippah, a head covering, and that's sort of a signal. I am a religious leader, you know, at this event. For women, it's a little bit more complicated. Not every woman feels comfortable wearing a kippah. I usually don't wear one, although there are situations where I have, because I think it sends a signal to people that like, I am a rabbi, I am a, I am a Jewish leader. It is, it's definitely complicated thinking about like, you know, will, does this dress that I'm going to wear on the Bima on Friday night or Saturday morning, right? Is it, is it appropriate? Is it, does it project authority? Does it work for Shabbat, right? There's a lot of questions that go, that go into that to go into everything I wear. You know, what does your talit, your prayer shawl look like? I have no idea if men think about this if men think about this, this particular question. Um, so there is something nice about on the occasions where we wear robes, wearing the robes and just not having to think about sort of what your, what your outside looks like. And you can focus more on potentially what your inside, what your inside looks like, which I think is also part of the point of Yom Kippur. When I worked for Ikar in Los Angeles, everybody wears white on Yom Kippur. Like there is no other color mm -hmm. in the entire congregation. Everybody's wearing white. And part of that is because we don't want to focus on what people are wearing, right? There's this sort of purity to white so that we can focus on our inside, so that we can focus on prayer and repentance and everything else that we're supposed to be focusing on, on, on Yom Kippur. That, that was a long way of answering your question. No, it's great. I was thinking as you were talking too that we talk about what we shouldn't do in terms of conforming ourselves to the external expectations of others, but then going to try to figure out the the inner and where to go get the alternative. And and your text reminded me of another text, which which I full disclosure, I didn't just come up with this on the spot, although <laughs> it is one of my go to texts. It's also from the the Talmud. And it says that if a person is born under Mars, so this is kind of a little astrological thing, I guess, when, when, when Mars is the planet, I guess that's ascendant, it's the red planet, the person will be someone who draws blood, maybe a surgeon, maybe a thief, maybe a shochet, who's someone who slaughters animals for kosher food, or maybe a, a mohel, which is a person who performs the ritual of circumcision to bring boys into the covenant. So I put the astrology part aside, you know, <laughs> which is probably part of its original context, and think that what it's saying is that there's a certain, you have a certain like range of destinies that have to do with you. In this case, it's, you know, they believed, you know, that some, you know, uh, let's say your innate your innate set of options, but, and also then something about your circumstances. And if you want, like, you could do, be the evil version of that or the medium version of that or the very righteous, quote unquote, version of that also. And, and I really like that as a way of saying, okay, like I have these qualities, like the worst version, what I was talking about before, the worst version of being a, you know, a conciliatory kind of person is to let people walk all over you and to be squishy and mushy. And, you know, another you know, another worse thing would be to to deny that and pretend you don't have it. And maybe the best person would be a good listener who's also, you know, listening out of your integrity. So so I, I've been trying to use that. Like, I think um, you the way you were describing Eleanor at the very start, like how you'd want to be, it seems like she has a you're saying she has a certain capacity for clarity and and thinking ahead that originally she uses to plan her her kind of pleasure seeking back in the early episodes, but that she can figure out how to deploy 
in service of the other thing. She's good at, at sort of leading on people and even pressuring them in the moment. I mean, she pressures Chidi in the episodes, including this one, to kind of basically lie, which she doesn't want to do or to be to be dishonest about things. And she uh, pre- finds her moment to press Jason and to like, you got to take this class. This You've got to no more waffling about whether you need this, you need this now. And so she used to use those things for bad and she figures out a way to loop them onto, you turn them into good. I've never heard that text. It's really interesting to think about sort of what is the spectrum of what is possible with all of us, right? And I think a lot of what we have been also talking about in this country right now in terms of questions about sort of race and socioeconomic class and and when you're born somewhere to some particular parents, right? There's, what is the range of people you can be And this, I, I, I like the way you thought about this text of like, what is the worst possible version of myself and the best possible version of myself, right? And some people are just immediately able to get to that best version of themselves. They just, and some people are the worst version of themselves and some people, you know, move back and forth in the middle. And I think Eleanor, it's, is so complicated because the reason she's pressuring Jason to take this class is not only because she wants him to be a better person, but because she's worried that exposing him will also expose her and then she'll get sent to the bad place, right? So her her actions and her intentions are maybe not completely aligned, aligned. The outcome of her actions means that Jason gets to move a little further along on that spectrum of sort of who is the worst version of Jason, who is the best, who is the best version of Jason. And I think this will come up I won't give anything away, but a number of more times as we meet other characters in the in the show about like, you know, and, and that's the essential question of this show in general, which is can people change, right? How how much can people change and how far along the, the spectrum can they move? And, you know, what is a destiny of your birth? Um, and we know that from looking at statistics that, you know, some people are more likely to be X or Y or Z, but how much do you have control over that? And I think that really is at the heart of the show, which is how much do you have control over who you are? And you said something earlier that really picks up for me another facet I hadn't thought about in this in this particular text, which is you said that being in the good place, like in the, the circumstance could actually be stifling or seems to be stifling a little bit to certainly to uh, Jason and to Eleanor, but I think you were suggesting possibly to everybody there and that that environment isn't, Necess- like they have to in a way fight I think what you're saying is they have to fight that environment in order to become better even though the environment is also the thing which makes it so urgent that they try to become better yeah I, I think Tahani who when you first meet her you think she's not a particularly sympathetic character right she seems very shallow and concerned only about kind of how good she can be I you know did this and I had this gala and I raised this many millions of dollars helped this many people and and she seems very concerned with her outward appearance but then I think about like how much pressure it must be to be that person right and I think I mean I'm not Tahani but I think all women and I certainly feel this way have this sense of like I have to be perfect I have to be better than everybody else I have to look perfect I have to present a certain face to the world and I think Tahani really Eleanor seems to care a little bit less about that, but Tahani really seems to, and maybe it's because I know her because I've watched the whole series now, but she seems to feel so much pressure, right? She, when her party doesn't go well, she resigns as Michael's assistant because she feels so ashamed that she couldn't do the thing that she was supposed to do and that she was expected to do. And so she thinks to herself, well, I can't be, you know, I can't be myself and I can't fail. And that, must be a lot of, that must be a lot of pressure. And that, you know, the idea that soup cannot just be soup, it has to be soup that saved 10,000 lives or whatever, whatever, however many lives it was. And I, I think that that is a lot of pressure that people feel in the world that I can only think about social media, right? I can only show my kids and I hiking to a beautiful waterfall, right? I can't show the part where my kid is having a struggle with their mental health or where they didn't get a good grade in school or they were crying or they, you know, had a meltdown on the road trip. I only can show to the world the good place version of myself. I guess that's why the flashbacks are so awesome is because they they 
connect something that we might be, in your words, kind of ashamed of to something that uh, to something that, you know, could be the seed of something good. I well, I, I have to ask myself, like, why did Jason go along with the charade in the first place? Right When he got there to the good place and Michael said, you are a Buddhist monk. Why did he just say, no, I'm not? Because he actually seems very proud of who he was, that 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 he seems like the kind of person who feels like I'm going to take off the acid cat helmet and I'm going to do my Jason thing, even if I get pelted with glow sticks and then I'm going to go blow up a boat and it'll be great. And and so I, I am curious, I would have loved to see that sort of part inside his brain where he said to himself, I will continue to be this Buddhist monk now. That seems a little bit out of character for him. And, and, and I'm just, I'm so curious about what made him decide that the face he wanted to present to the world in the good place was not him. <laughs> I love that. I love when he's trying to describe his, his figuring this whole thing out. Cause he does, he does tell Eleanor, <laughs> he just was like, I need to buy myself some time by, by not, you know, talking. And he says, I think this is an alien zoo or a prank show. <laughs> Oh yes. <laughs> oh God, it's just so brilliant. Um, but I had a I had a moment actually at the very start of my official career where I was offered a job. It's not that I was offered a job as a Buddhist monk, but as a as a <laughs> version of a rabbi that was very tempting to take. And I was almost I was about to be offered that job. I guess I would say. And I and a, as my I think twenty nine year old self, I had the I had the wisdom to say like that's not a version of me that's gonna that's going to work. But, but I so understood why, why people thought and some of my outside advisors thought that that would have been a, a good thing to do, you know, a, a kind of rabbi job that wouldn't anybody aspire to. Well, I, I don't want to criticize anything about that. It just wasn't, it just wasn't for me. I wasn't the person. I think actually the person who eventually settled into it was a way better version of that than, uh, than I possibly could have been. And I might have been able to do the job, but, I wouldn't have, but it wouldn't have been me doing it. But I can't see why you're thinking, okay, you're giving me the option of, you know, hanging out in this persona for a little bit. You know, well, I don't have a better option. I think I'll, you know, I, I could have done it. I could have, you know, done it, made some money for a few years while I figured it out. And that was uh, a possibility, I guess, that I considered. I mean, it's it, it's tempting sometimes not to be yourself. That's one of the things that is so great in some ways about sleepaway camp, that it's not that you don't be, you don't get to be yourself. It's that you potentially at sleepaway camp can either be another version of yourself to try on another version or the self that you've been putting out in the world for 10 months a year, you get to actually bring the, the more authentic self into that sleepaway camp space, right? That sleepaway camp in some ways is like the Jason Mendoza bud hole, right? That, <laughs> that you get to really be who you are because it's exhausting the other 10 months of the year when you have to be whoever it is you, you think you have to be during, during the school year. And so having, I think it can be very tempting to try on other personas at some points. And I don't, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that. We just have to know ourselves enough to come back to who we really to who we really are and really try to find a way to to bridge that a little bit to live a little bit more authentically right if you if you are a fan of Brene Brown which I am she talks about the importance of of vulnerability and that the only way you can really build a relationship is by being vulnerable with people which i think in my understanding really means showing people who you really are and you know, having them take it, take it or leave it. And that's, that's a little bit what's going on with Jason and Eleanor. And they're like, they, they are trying to find the courage to come out and say, this is who I am. And I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure I belong in this place, but really finding a way to live as their authentic and, and vulnerable selves. And then they're, they're st uh, stuck in this place, which is, I think, the equivalent in my Talmud thing of like Mars, Mars is Mars, like you, this is the planet you know, that you're born under, that you're living under. So you're stuck with that. And so the moment when when Jason, uh, after Eleanor has like said, okay, you stay in here and like, you know, keep, uh, and then when you come out, try it. And then he just bursts out in his, as you said, his uh, EDM uniform, <laughs> blasting from the middle of Tahani's, like it couldn't be the more opposite. <laughs> and I don't think I would realize until I watched it this time, just how like enchanting those moments were and just how, you know, the 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 combination of of goofy and so authentic that uh, that Jason and and the actor Manny Jacinto who pulls this off is just just so brilliant. And then he says, "I got to be myself," 
And then he he takes off, but he doesn't say I'm Jason. Whatever he says, I'm Mr. Music, the DJ. And then he does his thing, which I think is also a really true thing of, you know, this is this is my next try at presenting something, which is sort of like myself. I like that he has the hat too. Like he has he brings the uniform with him because he kind of knows that he can't just be acid cat. He has to be himself. That in in a lot of ways he is the character that presents with the most authenticity of any of the characters. Every other character is hiding something big. And once sort of the real Jason comes out, he's the real Jason for the whole show. Well, Rebecca, I could talk to you forever about this. And I so much look forward to having you back. Do you have a particular teacher who you want to call out to like introduce you to ethics or ethical philosophy? When I was in rabbinical school, I took a class with uh, Dr. Neil Gilman, Zihonoli Vraha, who is a great uh, philosopher and thinker. And it was a class on Mordecai Kaplan and Abraham Joshua Heschel and sort of the, the interplay between their ideas. And I think more than anything specific that I remember from that class, the thing I took away from it was just sort of that two pe- and is so much not a part of our current world, that two people could disagree so vehemently and still be in this relationship and discuss different philosophies and ideas and, and ways of thinking about Judaism um, that affected both of their lives very personally. Um, and I think about that when I think about my own approach to Judaism. You know, I'm a conservative rabbi. I work in a reform synagogue. I grew up at Congregation B'nai Jeshurun on the west side of Manhattan, which is non-denominational. And like my my way of looking at it is like, you want to be Jewish? That's great. Like, come on in. Let's all be Jewish together, right? You do this, I do that. It's all fine. Um, but that this idea that we can have a real serious discussion about ideas and that we can disagree, but still live under the same tent, that really stayed with me. Thank you, Rebecca, so much for talking with me today. This was so fun. I loved oh, it. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> I loved it. It was great. So that's another chapter of Tove in the books. Thank you, listening out there, for letting us be part of your day. If you'd like to see the Jewish texts we talked about or explore something further, the show notes are at tovegoodplace.com. That's T-O-V, good place, all mushed together. You can find Rabbi Rebecca Rosenthal and her baking adventures on Instagram at Rabbi Rebecca Bakes. I'm John Spirisavet, and my blog is rabbijohn.net, J-O-N, or follow me on Twitter at RabbiJS3. I'm looking forward to my next conversation with Rabbi Sari Laufer. If you're enjoying this podcast, tell someone else. Subscribe yourself. Follow us wherever you follow things at Tove Good Place. If you have ideas for how the podcast can be better in any way, email me at tove at tovegoodplace.com. Once again, thank you for listening. Now, go learn more about something good. Bum, 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 bum.